Can we proceed with Panos? Panos is going to present the second fermenter scan. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Panos Antsakis. I am uh, working in the University of Athens, Greece, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Sotiriadis for organizing uh, this webinar and introducing me um, and making me part of this webinar. And um, we're going to talk about the second trimester uh, ultrasound examination. It is uh, the so-called anomaly scan. It's traditionally called uh, the anomaly scan. And uh, the question why is why is it important to have a, a second trimester scan? And uh, uh, a quick answer for that could come from the many and different guidelines that we have for this very common test, which proves that it's uh, quite uh, important, and that's why there are so many guidelines for that. Um, so uh, what do these uh, different guidelines reflect? They reflect uh, of, uh, the different people who perform uh, this test in different countries, uh, which could also reflect uh, uh, the local medical practice uh, for each country, the religious and the cultural reasons, and of course different uh, legal considerations or even coverage from different insurance companies or national healthcare systems. So uh, the question is, why should uh, uh, someone have uh, a second trimester scan? And many of these reasons are uh, the same like in the first trimester scan that was uh, discussed earlier by um, uh, uh, Themis uh, Douglas. And so if someone hadn't had a scan until then, it's the right time to, to decide if it is a single pregnancy or a multiple pregnancy and also check uh, the gestational age, not with uh, such a good accuracy as in the first trimester, but with a quite good accuracy. And then check the fetal growth if it's normal. And the most important, the, most, uh, the main reason why we do the uh, second trimester scan is to check for fetal abnormalities or if there are any markers for chromosomal abnormalities. It's always a good idea to have a good look at the placenta, where exactly is the placenta, how does it look like? And of course, we can have uh, a screening regarding preterm labor and uh, preeclampsia. The other question is, uh, when should we have an anomaly scan than the second trimester scan? And the answer is, uh, it depends in which uh, country you live. So uh, in Greece, for example, where most women have a first trimester scan or uh, assessment of uh, the nuclear translucency, as we call it, we uh, usually do it sometime between 21 and 23 weeks, but in some other countries you can do it even earlier at uh, from 18 weeks and uh, some other countries like uh, Israel, they have um, a transvaginal assessment, which is much earlier around 60 weeks. And uh, the question is, can we see everything with a second trimester scan? And the answer is very reasonable it, and of course it is no, that we cannot detect everything. What is the detection rate? Of course, it depends on many things, and it could range from very low, which mainly is from uh, some older studies, up to high um, detection rates of about 85%. And that, of course, depends on the expertise and the experience of the person who is performing the second trimester scan, but also the quality of equipment. Not uh, all countries have expensive machines to perform the anomaly scan course how much time you spend to do the exam and one of the biggest problems we have in ultrasound nowadays is the increased BMI and in obstetrics another problem that we have is if uh, the fetus is not cooperating so if the, the position of, of the fetus is not uh, very good and this is something that we should uh, inform women and couples before we perform our anomaly scan and of course this is something that we should consider uh, uh, the ones who perform the scan and know our limitations and how we can become uh, even better. So who should do an anomaly scan? And that again depends on different countries and uh, who um, is uh, certified to do it according to the guidelines uh, of each country. Uh, the, the machines that should be used uh, have somehow standardized by uh, the different uh, ultrasound um, 
colleges. And uh, what we should know is that everything that we do when we perform uh, an ultrasound examination, especially the second trimester, we should be able at the end of the examination to give uh, a documented report uh, which could, which should um, show what we have checked um, and what we have not checked, what we have measured, and then all these things that we claim that we have uh, checked them and we have measured them, we should be able to give images either in an electronic form or in a printed form uh, so that uh, we have the proof that we have done all the things correctly. Um, so, when we talk about the second trimester scan, um, we should uh, be able, first of all, to determine some basic things like the number of the fetuses, the amount of the amniotic fluid, the location of uh, the placenta, and like in the first trimester, as it was mentioned earlier, it's always a good idea to have a look not only at the fetus, but also at uh, the ovaries and the uterus, just in case there is an abnormality which uh, we may miss and could be life-threatening for uh, these uh, young pregnant women. Our basic, uh, our basic measurements uh, include uh, uh, measurement of the head. So we check the BPD and the head circumference, the bipyretal diameter and the head circumference at, that, uh, at the level that we uh, would be able to see the CSP, which is uh, the carbon uh, septum pellucidum and uh, we should not be seeing the cerebellum at that point. We should take a measurement uh, of, the, um, of the abdomen, and again, at, the, uh, at a point that we can see the stomach, uh, the kidneys should not be visualized, and a part of the umbilical vein uh, at the level of the proteus sinus should be seen. And then we should measure um, the thigh bone, the femur, uh, at an angle uh, of about 45 to 90 degrees. And then once we finish our uh, measurements, we should check the anatomy of the fetus. And uh, usually, not always, depending on, on the position of the fetus, we can start from the head and have a look at the central nervous system. We always try and take um, uh, two sec uh, three sections, two uh, axial planes uh, through the ventricles and one through the thalamus and a third plane that should go through uh, the cerebellum. Um, uh, a mark uh, that we use when we look at the brain is uh, the carbon septum pellucidum, which is an indirect marker that the corpus uh, uh, callosum is intact. Um, and then depending on uh, whether we can see the carbon septum pellucidum, we can uh, try and rule out some of, uh, uh, of, of the major uh, central nervous CNS abnormalities like the genesis of the corpus callosum or uh, uh, more severe things like a severe holoprosencephaly and of course uh, more milder things like a, an isolated absence of the septum pellucidum. And as we said, um, the um, visualizing the carbon septum pellucidum is an indirect marker of the integrity of the corpus callosum, but now with the new methods that we have, we can uh, many times have a direct look at the corpus callosum of uh, the fetus. We should also be um, able to identify the ventricles um, of the brain, so we should have an idea about the anatomy of the ventricular system, and uh, we should be able to visualize um, um, abnormalities like a very dilated ventricles, which could be um, direct, uh, related with hydranencephaly uh, or with severe infections or anatomical problems sometimes. We should be able to uh, measure the posterior um, ventricles. And then we should uh, not just identify, but we should also have a workout of how we should manage these cases. For example, when we have uh, um, a ventricular megaly, uh, we should know that it's something that is not very rare, uh, not very rare, it's about one in 100 fetuses, and um, we should have a better look to the uh, rest of the fetus to check if it is an isolated or um, um, finding or not, and then discuss with a couple the possibility of um, karyotype, now we have molecular genetics, 
check for some of the most common congenital infections like toxoplasmosis and cytomegalovirus. If needed, many times we ask for a better study of the brain with an MRI, and then we should know that most of the times when this is isolated, it's a very subtle thing, it's, it's not a big problem for the fetus, and even better if it is found in a male fetus, then again the prognosis is even better than uh, in a female. And then we should have a look at the cerebellum. We should be able to identify, to measure first of all uh, the length of the cerebellum, the transcerebellar diameter, and the cisterna magna, this is the CNM as we call it. Identify the fourth uh, ventricle and the vermis. And we should know the normal limits of the cisterna magna, which should be around 2 uh, to 10 millimeters, and then try and see if it is longer than that, which is uh, can be a pathological problem. If it is less than that, then we should be able to see the cerebellum and see if it's normal or not. And if it is a dilated cisterna magna CM, we should try and see how does this dilated uh, cisterna magna look and try and make a workout of, it, of whether it could be um, uh, related with an abnormality like um, the vermian hyperplasia or Dundee Walker malformation or Viam, and then if it could be something milder uh, like a Blake's pouch cyst. The spine, um, we should uh, be able to um, uh, study the spine in three uh, sections. And uh, one of the most common abnormalities that we could uh, identify is uh, the spina bifida. Uh, if we cannot uh, see for any reason because of a high BMI or uh, of the position of the, uh, of the fetus, especially if it is in a breech position, then uh, we have an indirect method of, uh, um, uh, of being suspicious of a problem in the spinal cord through the shape of the uh, head of the fetus, uh, what we call the lemon sign, of or the shape of the cerebellum, what we call the banana sign, which have been described by Professor Nicolaitis in the past. And then other cases like uh, teratoma, sacrococcygeal teratoma. And uh, of course, what we should uh, explain to the couple again is that uh, most of the times when we do our basic uh, CNS examination, most of the times everything will be fine. But of course, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, all of the times we will exclude all the abnormalities. Uh, what we can tell them, though, is that for um, severe abnormalities like an open spinal bifida, we have a very good detection rate, and we're very good at detecting, detecting these things um, uh, nowadays. The fetal heart has always been a challenge. Now we have the five sections that we use with the four chamber view, the outflow tracks, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Of course, we always check the, the situs of uh, the fetal heart and the aorta and the three vessel view. And this is usually how uh, we check um, these uh, sections starting from the higher level and going to the lower one. And uh, as we said, uh, detecting fetal heart abnormalities has always been one of the greatest challenges uh, during the second trimester scan. It is one of the most frequently missed abnormalities, but uh, it is something that we have improved during the last uh, few years, the, the last decades. And uh, one other thing that we have been using as a screening method is the nuclear translucency which uh, is a very useful tool for making us suspicious or uh, making us look at the heart um, in more detail, especially when we have excluded chromosomal abnormalities and we have an increased nuclear translucency. And the fact that apart from the basic heart examination that we have with the four uh, chambers of the heart, now we do a more extended basic cardiac examination, as uh, we call it. And just by using the four chambers and the outflow tracts, we have increased our detection rate um, two to three times, which is very, very important. And what we should always uh, remember is that um, we can always have a look at other uh, milder um, findings, like uh, a golf ball 
what, uh, what uh, we do find sometimes in the heart, if there is any pericardial infusion, um, if it is a right aortic arch, uh, whether it's a U-shaped or uh, a typical right aortic uh, arch, um, if we have a persistent uh, left superior vena cava, the VSD, or an aberrant right subclavian artery, what we call an ARSA. And we should remember that the four chain review is a very good way of assessing the heart, but many times it's not enough because in these cases we can have, we can miss an abnormality of the great vessels, like in this case where we have a normal chain review. But if we go a little bit higher, we would see a TGA transposition of the great arteries. The feeling phase uh, is always a challenge to assess. Um, one of the things that we are worried about is whether there's a cleft palate. Uh, we're not worried so much about it because um, plastic surgery is very good at uh, repairing these uh, uh, cleft palates and the cleft lips. But what we are worried sometimes, especially now that we have molecular genetics, is uh, that it could be a part of more complex situations. So it may need uh, a more detailed assessment. And in 3D and 4D uh, ultrasound technology has um, uh, uh, helped us improve the detection rate in such cases. And of course, we should be able to know how to approach these cases. And uh, uh, we always need to have an algorithm in our head of how to, to work out these cases, if it is on one side or uh, in two sides, and what uh, to do. And then we have to look at the rest uh, of the abdomen. We have to look at the stomach, the kidneys, uh, especially for the kidneys. We're worried if uh, there is any problem, uh, any malformations or any obstructions uh, in, the, uh, in the kidneys, and these, in it, whether these findings could be related with any genetic findings. Uh, hydronephrosis is a very common finding, and uh, most of the times it's not, uh, it's not a problem at all but we should be able to measure uh, this uh, hydronephrosis and look at other characteristics like um, the amniotic fluid, the, uh, the, the way the kidneys look, and uh, uh, how uh, the caliceal system is uh, involved or not in this situation. And again, we should have um, an algorithm in our head and how to approach these cases, and we should know but uh, it's one of the soft markers that does not increase our risk for chromosomal abnormality significantly. Uh, one of the things that we may find is bilateral renal agenesis, which most of the times we, uh, I do find an easy diagnosis because uh, usually there is no um, amniotic fluid around. You don't see the kidneys at all. So there are only three things that you should be worried about if there are rupture of membranes if it is uh, early on today, UGR, or a bilateral renal genesis, all three uh, with a very uh, poor prognosis. But uh, always we should be really careful with these conditions and avoid to say that uh, the kidneys are absent. We should say that we cannot see them, but we cannot be sure uh, if they're there or not. And uh, a unilateral renal genesis, which is uh, not uh, a dangerous condition, but it is very difficult diagnosis many times because the, we may not see the one of the kidneys, but the kidney may be there, but just in a different position. So for us, difficult to see. Uh, an omphalocele, uh, which is associated with chromosomal abnormalities, and usually the cording session is um, uh, on the sac far from the abdominal wall. And that's a way to differentiate it from the gastroschisis, which is a condition that is not usually associated associated with chromosomal abnormalities and has a much better uh, prognosis. Limbs, again, uh, we should look at the limbs and we should try and find any problems with, uh, with, the, with the fingers, the toes, or if there is any club foot, if there is any uh, um, problem in the shape of the bones, like in skeletal dysplasias, or if there is something that we call a rocker bottom foot, which again, can be related with some especially chromosomal conditions. And apart from the anatomical survey that we do in the second trimester, we try and measure uh, the cervical length, which is a method that has been standardized so far. And we know 
how uh, the spike length during the second trimester is related with an increased risk of preterm labor if the cervical length is, um, is uh, short, and especially if it's shorter than uh, 25 millimeters or even more if it is lower than 15 millimeters. And finally, we try and check the uterine arteries and uh, uh, define in a second stage. We saw how we do it in the first trimester, but again, we'll have a look uh, at the second trimester and uh, assess the risk for um, uh, preeclampsia and IUGR, uh, intrauterine growth restriction. And as uh, we said earlier, depending on which country you are and what system you use, you should have a system on how to document all these things and give um, a written or electronic or printed documentation to uh, the couple or the woman that you have done the anomaly scan of what you have checked, what you have found, and what is the sensitivity and, and of the tests that you are doing. There are different forms of doing that, and of course in different countries there are different ways of uh, documenting all your findings. So, second trimester scan is a very detailed, uh, very important scan that needs a systematic uh, approach. And in order to detect abnormalities, we should be familiar with what is normal fetal anatomy. We should have our, uh, nor uh, our landmarks and know the normal variants. And uh, it is what we call a head-to-toe examination. Of course, we all have to try and get better. So we should have our own approach and we should audit ourselves and try and become even better. Documentation is a very, um, very, very important for second trimester scan as in any other scan. Continuous medical education and training, new things uh, are coming out, new technologies are coming out and that improve um, our abilities and our detection rate. And of course, scanning is not just in the scan, but is also uh, spending time with a mother, with a couple, and explaining to them what are their options, what are the limits of our uh, tests, and uh, what we can find and what we can miss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Panos. Now, we have a question for you. So, the question refers to the angle of measurement whenever you measure the, uh, the, the lateral ventricle. And the question is, whether, whether the line of the measurement should be perpendicular mm -hmm. vertical to the midline or perpendicular to the walls of the ventricle, the anterior mm -hmm. of the posterior uh, hole? Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear you very well. If you could uh, repeat the question uh, regarding the measurement of the posterior ventricle or the anterior ventricle. The question is whether your line should be vertical, perpendicular to the midline or mm -hmm. to the walls of the ventricle itself. Well, uh, okay, I'm not sure I understood very well. So you need to have your plane of uh, assessing um, the ventricles as we show, showed in the picture. So you should have um, a section and the midline should be in the middle of the brain. So from there you should have vertical lines which should be on to on to the lines of the ventricles. I, d I don't know if I covered your question. Well, the, the question is whether the line should be vertical to the midline or yeah. vertical to the wall of the ventricle, because the wall of the ventricle is not parallel to the midline. Ah, oh, I see, I see. So, yeah, I see. Right yes. Well, sometimes yeah, you're right. It's not very, so. It should be more to the uh, to the to the ventricles rather than the midline. Of course, it always depends a little bit on how you do the measurement, and there is a, a very nice. Uh, uh, in, in Eastwalk, a very nice guideline of, of how you should uh, measure the ventricles, and it should be um, uh, related to the ventricles. And what would be the upper limit for the for the anterior horn? For the anterior horn, okay. <laughs> uh, well, in many cases, many people don't uh, even measure the anterior horn. Uh, 
but uh, I'm not sure I know a number that would be, I mean, you should be able to see the carbon septum pellucidum. You should see the anterior ventricles because if there's no carbon septum pellucidum, you wouldn't see the anterior horn. But uh, I don't know if, I don't, I'm not sure about the upper limit. I don't know if you know it. Yeah, well, well, well I guess that probably we should stick with a 10 millimeter. Yes, I mean, 10 is something that is used, but I have questioned myself as well. And I think that mainly the reason why we measure the anterior ventricles is to see, to show that we have seen the anterior ventricles. Because if, if you have seen them, um, then you have to see the carbon septum pellucidum. Otherwise, if the posterior is increased and there is other abnormalities like a genesis of corpus callosum, then you're not really measuring the anterior horns. You're measuring something different. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct. Well, 